Hi, this is Mr. Beck. This is the first in several lectures about magnetism and electromagnetism for my AP Physics 2 class, so I hope you enjoy it. In this introduction to magnetism, we're going to be talking about the history of magnets, which, of course, we're going to have to talk about the compass. We're going to get a little bit into you know, why magnetism exists in the first place, and then we're going to talk about magnetic field lines and how they relate to the magnets and the poles of the magnet. Magnets have been known since ancient times. There were naturally occurring rocks, uh, which we now call lodestone, and these had certain magnetic properties. They were iron rich, and when you would hang them from a string, I don't know who thought to hang it from a string in the first place, uh, what you discovered is that one side would always point in the same direction. So if you were to turn it, it would spin itself back to the way it was originally oriented. And so this was kind of the origin of the original compass. If you take a, nowadays, if you just take a needle, rub it against a magnet, you can stick it in a cork, float it in the water, and you'll find that when it's free to turn, one side will always be pointing north, and one side will always be pointing to the south. So this was the compass that enabled early navigation, and of course we've come very far since then, but just, you know, we've known about magnets since ancient times. So as we said, one side of a compass will always point to the north. And so as you move around the Earth, you'll always have that one side pointing towards the north. And so we are going to label that with the letter N. So the N is the side of the compass that will point north. The same with a bar magnet. If you take a bar magnet and you hang it from a string, the N should point to the north. This is just by convention. We call that the north pole of the compass. Now what's interesting is since magnets are attracted, the south side will attract to a north. The opposite poles of a magnet attract kind of like electric charges, a positive and a negative will attract. And then if you had two magnets where uh, you put the norths together, then those like poles will repel and push apart. What this means is um, that inside the Earth, if we imagine the Earth as a large magnet, the north geographic pole of the Earth must be a south magnetic pole so that the north pole of the magnet will point towards it. So it's important to know that the Earth is actually, uh, the magnet is a south on the north of the Earth and the north on the south of the Earth. So the north geographic pole is a south magnetic pole. Now what is actually creating the magnetism that we see? Well, as a hint, if we take a magnet and we break it into two pieces, what we find is that the original magnet with the north and south will create a smaller magnet that has a north and a south pole and another magnet that has a north and a south pole. If we were to take each one of those and break it, we would again get magnets with north, south, north, south, north, south, north, south. You cannot have just a north pole of a magnet. And that's because if you continue to break it down to the, to the fundamental particle level, since there's always a north and south, it turns out that every electron behaves as if it's spinning, and later on we're going to figure out that uh, moving charges create magnetic fields, but this spinning electron makes each electron have a north and a south pole. So down to the fundamental level, there's a north and a south on the basic electron level, and you can't even break an electron into multiple pieces. So therefore, that fundamental particle is north-south already, so you can never have just a monopole north or just a monopole. One explanation for magnetism talks about unpaired electrons because electrons tend to pair up where you'll have one magnetic pointing this way and one magnetic pointing that way and those two will cancel out and not be magnetic. So what we need is unpaired electrons and when we look at the periodic table if you know a little bit of chemistry it it's unpaired electron in the d orbitals. Not that this is important for AP physics but if we have those unpaired electrons then what we find is that on the electron level we get a north side of the electron as a magnet. If we go to the atomic level, we'll have many electrons, and if those electrons actually can contribute their magnetism and not be canceled out, then the atom as a whole can have a north pole and a south pole. Now, if we take many atoms, we are going to get what we call a domain, a magnetic domain. So a small portion of an object will have that magnetic domain, and if all the atoms are pointing or a significant number are pointing in the same direction, then the net from all of those atoms is going to give us a north and of course a south. And then if we take many domains, then we can get a three-dimensional object. And that object, most objects, even if the object has some magnetic uh, potential, um, 
if the domains are pointing in different directions, then the overall magnetism will cancel out. So iron is a, a, iron is a material that can have magnetic properties, but it's not always going to be a permanent magnet because the domains will point in opposite directions. So the key to getting an object to be a permanent magnet is that if we take those domains, what we can do is align the domains in order to make the permanent magnet. And what we can do is we can take the object and if we melt it, then we place it in an external magnetic field and then cool it down. That allows those domains and the atoms to reorient themselves so that we get something where all of the domains or the majority of the domains are pointing in the same direction. And when we get the domains pointing in the same direction, then we have ourselves a permanent magnet. So if you take a, uh, a piece of iron, you melt it, you put it in an external magnetic field and you cool it back down, you can turn that piece of iron into a permanent magnet. Now permanent is um, you know, not meaning forever, very often that magnetism will fade over time as the domains will reorient themselves into random directions. If you drop a magnet, you can weaken the magnet, but uh, we call it a permanent magnet just because it will hold on to that magnetic field for quite some time. The idea that when a liquid becomes a solid that it could hold on to the external magnetic field in which it was cooled provides some of the best evidence for plate tectonics, the idea that the continents were drifting apart from one another on uh, the large continental plates. So in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that we can go and measure. Of course, this is a very exaggerated picture of it, but what we find is that there's a pattern of magnetic field on either side of that ridge where what we find is that the pattern on one side would have the magnetic field reversing and then going uh, proper again and then reversing and then going proper again. So you get a, a areas where the magnetic polarity is normal and areas where the magnetic polarity is reversed. And it turns out that it's mirrored on either side of the ridge. Now, the Earth's magnetic field will reverse on a period of hundreds of thousands to millions of years, where the North Pole will become the South Pole and the South Pole will become the North Pole magnetically. And so as that magma comes up from the uh, center of the Earth, it will solidify in a certain orientation. And then as the continent spreads um, and that mid-Atlantic ridge pulls apart, then when the magnetic field is reversed, you'll get a reverse polarity and then back to normal polarity again. And so since the patterns were mirrored on either side of the mid-Atlantic ridge, it showed uh, that that, uh, that surface could have been stretching apart and laying down new rock in the middle of that ridge and had that match the magnetic field of the Earth. So that provided some great evidence for plate tectonics. Now we have to talk about magnetic field lines. Just like an electric charge will set up a electric field and we can draw that electric field with electric field lines that originate on positive charges and terminate or end on negative charges, we have magnetic field lines around magnets and they look kind of the same outside. We see the magnetic field lines originate on the north side of the magnet, go around and they'll end on the south side of the magnet, but that's outside the magnet. It turns out that inside the magnet, they are going to be going from south to north. So inside the magnet, each one of these lines will actually continue around. And what we get is instead of lines that start on one side and end on the other, we get complete loops in terms of uh, magnetic field lines. So magnetic field lines never end. They're always going to be a complete loop um, that on the outside is going north to south, but on the inside goes south to north. Now, it's a little tough to get inside a bar magnet, but later on when we're talking about electromagnets, this is going to be very important to show what direction those magnetic field lines are going. So they're going to go from the north to the south on the outside and from the south to the north inside. Now, we also see that when we take a compass, the compass sets up its own magnetic field and that magnetic field will interact with the magnetic field from the, the, the bar magnet in this case, and the compass will always align with the magnetic field. So you'll see here, uh, heading into the south, this little compass has a north side that's attracted to the south because it's following the magnetic field lines that are pointing in towards the south pole of the magnet. And remember, the north pole of the Earth is a south magnetic pole, 
and that's why each one of the magnets, each one of the compasses, will be pointing towards that side of the Earth, the North Geographic Pole or the South Magnetic Pole. So that's what we need to know about magnetic field lines for the moment, and I will see you later for lecture number two.